Uh, my name is Bob Tejan. I'm a professor of MCB at the University of California at Berkeley, and I'm also serving as the uh, president of the Howard Hughes. I'm going to spend the next 25 or 30 minutes telling you about some fundamentals of one of the most important molecular processes in living cells, which is the expression of genes through a process called transcription. Now, first, to understand what gene expression means, you have to have a sense of what we tend to refer to in the field as the central dogma of molecular biology. Another way to think about this is the flow of biological information from DNA, in other words, our chromosomes, which every cell has its complement, uh, to be transcribed into a sister molecule called RNA. So this process of converting DNA into RNA is called transcription. And that is the topic uh, of this lecture. This process is very complicated, as you'll see by the end of my two lectures. And it is very important for many, many fundamental processes uh, in biology. So what I'm going to spend today's lecture on is the discovery of a large family of transcription proteins. These are factors, we call them, that are key molecules that regulate the use of genetic information uh, that has been encoded in the genome. Now transcription factors or proteins are involved in many fundamental aspects of biology including embryonic development, cellular differentiation, and cell fate. In other words, pretty much what your cells are doing, how a tissue works, and how an organism survives and reproduces is dependent on the process of gene expression. And the first step in this process is transcription. Now, there's, there are many other reasons why uh, a large group of people and scientists are interested in transcription. And another reason is that understanding the fundamental molecular mechanisms that controls transcription in humans or in any other organism uh, can inform us and teach us about what happens when something goes wrong for example, in diseases. And I list here just a few diseases that uh, you know, we could study as a result of understanding the structure and function of these transcription factor proteins that I'm going to be telling you about. And of course, the hope is that in understanding the molecular underpinnings of complex diseases like cancer, diabetes, Parkinson's, and so forth, that we will be able to develop and use uh, better, th more specific therapeutic drugs, and also to develop more accurate and rapid diagnostic tools. So those are a couple of the reasons why many of us have spent, in my case, over 30 years studying this process of transcriptional regulation. Now, to get the whole thing started, I have to give you a sense of what the, the magnitude of the problem is. So imagine that one would really like to understand how this process of decoding the genome happens in humans. So as you may know, the human genome has some three billion base pairs or bits of genetic information, and that encodes roughly 22,000 genes. These are uh, stretches of DNA sequence that encode ultimately a product uh, that is a protein, uh, which actually makes the cells function. So as I already explained to you, there's this flow of biological information where you have to extract the information buried in DNA, convert it into RNA, and what I'm not going to tell you about today is the process of going from RNA to protein, which is a, a, a reaction called a translational reaction. I'm going to instead just focus on the first step of converting DNA into RNA, which is the process of transcription. Now, one of the most uh, amazing results that we got over the last decade or so was when the human genome was entirely sequenced, the first few that were sequenced, uh, we realized that actually the number of genes in humans is not vastly different from many other organisms, uh, even simple organisms like uh, little worms or fruit flies and so forth. That is, roughly 22 to 25,000 genes is all the number of genes that all of these different organisms have. And yet, 
uh, anybody looking at us versus a, uh, a little roundworm in the soil or a fruit fly can tell that we're a much more complex organism with a much bigger brain, much more complex uh, behavior and so forth. So how does this happen? S uh, part of the answer to, to this very interesting mi mystery or paradox lies in the way that genes are organized and how they're regulated. And one of the most striking results of the genome sequencing project was to realize that a vast, vast majority of the DNA in our chromosomes is actually not coding for specific gene products and that only roughly 3% of the DNA is actually encoding, let's call those little arrows that I show you on this uh, purple DNA, are the gene coding regions. So you'll notice that there's a lot of non-arrow sequences, which I'll show you in this next slide as green. These are non-coding regions. So the vast majority, 97% or greater, is non-coding. So what are these other sequences doing? And of course, it turns out that these sequences carry very important little fragments of DNA, uh, which we call regulatory sequences. And these are the sequences that actually control whether a gene gets turned on or not. And I'll be spending much of the next 20 minutes telling you about how this process all works and what these little bits of DNA uh, uh, sequences actually function to uh, control gene expression. Now, the other thing that I have to uh, bring you up to date on is this, this mysterious process we're calling transcription, which you know, reads double-stranded DNA and then makes a related molecule, which is a single-stranded RNA molecule, which is an informational molecule. That reaction is catalyzed by a very complex multi-subunit enzyme called RNA polymerase II. Now, there's the Roman numero II at the end of this because there are actually three enzymes in uh, most uh, mammals, uh, at least three enzymes that carry out different processes and different uh, types of RNA production, but I'm only going to tell you about the ones that make the classical uh, messenger RNA, which then ultimately becomes proteins. So now, one of the things that we learned early on in the study of uh, uh, mammalian or other multicellular organism uh, transcription processes is that Despite the fact that this enzyme is quite complex in its structure, it turns out to be an enzyme that nevertheless needs a lot of help to do its job. So on its own, this RNA polymerase II cannot tell the difference between the non-coding regions of the genome and places where it's supposed to be coding or reading to make the appropriate uh, messenger RNAs. So this sort of leads you to think that there must be a number of other factors that somehow directs RNA polymerase to the right place at the right time in the genome of every cell in your body so that the right products get made so each cell in your body is functioning properly. And this is where things get really interesting is uh, some 25, 30 years ago a number of laboratories uh, took on the job of hunting for these elusive, and as it turned out, uh, specialized protein factors that recognize these little stretches of DNA sequences that I've been telling you about that make up the vast majority of the non-coding part of the genome, uh, and how these proteins then can recognize and ultimately physically interact with these little bits of genetic information to then turn genes on or off. So let's go back to the sort of the basic unit of gene expression, which is a gene here shown in the uh, orange uh, arrow, uh, and the non-coding sequences surrounding it. And you'll see that now I've added a few more elements to this purple DNA. You see some symbols, a uh, blue square, a round circle that's pink, and then a yellow triangle. Those are just uh, a way for me to graphically represent the little bits of DNA sequences that I told you about that are the regulatory sequences. So the, the little round one happens to be very GC rich, the uh, triangle one is a classical element uh, that's called a Tata box, I'll tell you about a little bit later, and the blue one is yet another recognition element. So why are we so interested in these little stretches of, uh, of nucleic acid sequence uh, in the genome when it's buried amongst 
uh, billions of other sequences. Well, these individual little sequences turn out to be very important because of where they sit. You'll notice they're sitting near the top of the arrow, uh, and they are recognized by very special proteins, which are the transcription factors. So now I've shown you some symbols with little cutouts which fit into either the square, the circle, or the triangle. So transcription factors, at least one major family of transcription factors, are proteins whose three-dimensional structure is folded into a shape that allows them to recognize these short stretches of double-stranded DNA. Uh, in fact, largely through interactions with the major group of DNA, and I'll show you a structure of one in a little bit. So, now it turns out that there are probably thousands of these transcription factors because the number of genes that we have to control, as I showed you, is in the order of 20 or 25,000 genes. And so it turns out that you need a pretty large percentage of the genome devoted to encoding these regulatory proteins in order for a complex organism like ourselves to survive. Then the other component of this, uh, let's call it the transcriptional apparatus, is of course the enzyme that catalyzes RNA. And I already told you that this enzyme uh, on its own can't tell the difference between random DNA sequence and a gene or a promoter. These other sequence-specific DNA binding proteins are the ones that must recruit or otherwise direct RNA polymerase to essentially land on the right place and at the right time in the genome to turn on a certain subset of genes that are specifically required in a, in, in a specialized cell type, whatever cell you happen to be looking at. So that is kind of the first level of complexity of sort of informational interactions between the transcription factors and the more ubiquitous and I would call a promiscuous RNA polymerase II enzyme. Well, as it turns out, it took several decades to work out most, if not all, of the components of this so-called transcriptional machinery. Uh, and it turns out in this uh, slide I'm showing you, things are already starting to get more complicated. So not only do you have RNA polymerase, but you have a bunch of other proteins that go by names like TF2, A, B, you know, D, E, H, F, and so forth. So it looks like there are going to be many, many proteins that are necessary to form the transcriptional apparatus. And then on top of that, you need sequence-specific DNA binding proteins, which I already uh, described to you, to further inform or otherwise regulate the process of when a particular RNA polymerase molecule should be binding to a particular gene. So I want to show you now what is sort of our state-of-the-art thinking about what is actually needed to build the machinery at a gene to allow it to be expressed and transcribed. And the term I want to introduce you to is the pre-initiation complex. And it's pretty much what it says. It's the complex of multiple subunits that has to essentially land on the promoter of a gene which will be designated for uh, later expression. And this is a process that is probably quite uh, orderly, that is there's an e order of events that happens which we, by the way, are not entirely sure exactly what the order is or even if the order is the same from one gene to the next, but we can kind of see where it starts and where it ends up and the pathway in between, I would say, is still a little bit murky. And the story here, again, starts with a little snippet of DNA called the Tata box, which I already introduced you to uh, briefly. It's an AT-rich sequence which sits uh, at the five prime end or the beginning of many genes, but not all genes. Maybe 20% of the genes might contain this uh, AT-rich region. Um, and that AT sequence uh, is the signal or a landmark, if you like, for a particular protein to bind to it. And that protein is called, not surprisingly, the Tata binding protein because it's the Tata sequence. And so this is, represents a second class of transcription factors. These are not the type that I just introduced you to, which are going to be different for every gene. The Tata sequence is present in a very large number of genes, so it can't be gene-specific. But it turns out to be very crucial for our understanding of how gene regulation works. So, uh, so you start with 
a, a Tata binding protein finding a Tata box. We later found out that the Tata binding protein rarely functions on its own. It has a bunch of friends that we call TAFs for TBP associated factors. And now you're talking about an assembly of multi subunit complex of almost a million Daltons. There are somewhere between 12 to 15 subunits in addition to the Tata binding protein that make up this little uh, complex of proteins that kind of travels around together. Uh, and this is found in most cell types. And uh, later on, I'll show you in a subsequent lecture that not every cell type might have exactly the same complement of these subunits, but many of them have this uh, prototypic complex. Is this enough for uh, building the pre-initiation complex? Unfortunately not. Uh, it turns out that there are a host of other, I'll call them ancillary factors, in addition to the multi subunit RNA polymerase itself, that are necessary for you to build up uh, an ensemble that is necessary to form an active, ready to, to, to activate transcriptional pre initiation complex, or the PIC. And, and this is kind of the picture where. Uh, getting to, and even this picture with many, many colors and many, many different polypeptides, you know, that adds up to probably greater than 85 individual proteins that all have to kind of fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. It's probably not even the whole story. You'll notice I still have one big red question mark there because I think as we begin to study specific cell types and specific processes like embryonic development or germ layer formation, uh, additional components that are not present here in this prototypic pre-initiation complex will, will come into play, and, uh, uh, and that's a subject of a subsequent lecture. But already you can tell that the transcriptional machinery is anything but simple. So can we get a better idea of what transcription might actually look like in, 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 in what's happening when a transcription process takes place? So, let me first of all say that I'm going to finish my lecture now with a, a little cartoon, which is our um, attempt to imagine the events that take place when you form a pre-initiation complex, you bring regulatory proteins at to, to the activated gene, and what happens uh, during this process. Now, keep in mind that this is at this point mostly a cartoon that is a, in our imagination and only parts, or if any, of this is probably real. But it gives you a sense of, of the complexity of the transactions that have to take place just for one gene to transcribe and express itself. So let me show you the movie, uh, and then we'll, we'll finish just by keeping in mind that uh, there's much to be learned, and in my next lecture we'll go into the selectivity of this process in uh, specialized cell types. So now let's see what, what this uh, sort of this cartoon of transcription uh, looks like. So we start off with DNA with some pre-assembled TF2D molecule and along comes this other green molecule which is actually a cofactor which then forms this very large complex with RNA polymerase and then a distal activator protein came in and activated the process and this, this molecule this, this bluish molecule that's moved away from, from the complex is actually the RNA polymerase, and that little yellow s sort of uh, bead on a string is actually the RNA product. So that gives you a sense of, you know, things have to happen quickly, and yet it involves many, many molecules having to assemble and then disassemble to give you this reaction to happen. And um, uh, in my next lecture, we'll go into more specific aspects of this reaction and particularly during uh, embryonic development and tissue-specific uh, gene expression.